I'd like to introduce my next speaker, Angelica Cristo Donati, who is the CEO of Donati Immobiliare Group. She's a real estate entrepreneur and prop tech founder, investor, and thought leader. She holds a Bachelor of Science from LSE and an MBA from Oxford University said business school. She started her career on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs, and after her MBA, she entered the real estate sector and established the Donati Group. And she is a passionate advocate for change within real estate and construction and a contributor to Forbes, which is where I discovered her. I'm a regular reader of her columns. And she is also a G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance delegate. And in 2019, she became an advisory partner at PropTech VC Concrete, which deploys minority investment capital into early stage startups. Angelica, welcome to our stage. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for very much. Me. I'm just going to shake your elbow. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, thank you, Bob, for the introduction. I was going to introduce myself, but I guess I no longer need to. So I've been listening to some of the presentations this morning, and what I'm going to do here today is to take a bit of a step back, um, and for the next 20 minutes to half an hour, my goal is to give you a bird's eye view of, well, what it says on the slide, what are the greatest opportunities, or some of the greatest opportunities in prop tech today. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, but the... Um, click, okay, great. Um, so, well, I don't need to introduce myself because Bob did it so well before. Um, I also don't think any of you really need me to formally define what PropTech is. There's a lot of official definitions out there. You probably know more than I do. Uh, but put simply, it is just the acronym used to describe any technology in the real estate space, from software to hardware, from materials to manufacturing. Now, the reason why you're all here listening to me is because in a handful of years, PropTech has gone from a niche play to a truly global phenomenon. Um, let's just look at a few numbers to put this into perspective. Um, investment in 2011, which was the first year I could find any data from, for, was just $186 million globally. It then jumped to 2.67 billion in 2016, and then really soared to 12 in 2017. In 2018, we saw over $15 billion globally invested in the prop tech space. But what is really incredible is what happened in 2019, which is the year that prop tech really hit the mainstream. Um, I don't have full year figures yet, but as of Q3 2019, global VCs have poured almost $25 billion into the prop tech space. This is a crazy meteoric rise and really cements the fact that PropTech is here to stay and we must all take note and implement it in our real estate businesses. Before we go into the opportunities I was telling you about, let's just have a think about where the money is going and also which are the areas in the real estate ecosystem which can benefit the most from an inje injection of technology. Without thinking of specific asset classes, asset classes, oh, sorry, asset classes right now, let's think about this question from the perspective of the building life cycle, which I've represented here on the screen, which runs from acquisition through construction all the way through to well, management and then disposals. A report published by the BPF, the British Property Federation, shows that there is a big bias towards asset management type tech solutions. And we also know that, unfortunately, there isn't much tech at all being deployed in the planning phase, as this requires interaction with local authorities and government and can't really be automated away. With regards to construction tech, or contech, as people in the industry like to call it, there is a lot to be said about what is going on in that space, but that could be an entire presentation in its own right. So if you agree, I would not talk about contact, but only fo focus on asset management today. So at the moment, as we said, asset management is the stage in the property lifecycle which has the most tech deployed in it. And let's consider what this actually means. So traditionally, if you think about asset management, what was it? It was simply buying a building, whatever it was, whether it was an office block or a residential building or a mall or you name it, um, collecting rent and just hoping your tenants didn't bother you too much. 
in the interim. Increasingly, however, asset management has shifted away from this traditional transactional model and into what I like to call the service of real estate. This, in turn, is nothing other than customer experience management, enabling your end users, whether these be residents or employees in an office or shoppers in a mall, to have the best possible experience within your asset. In fact, landlords have clued into the fact that happy end users equates to a stronger portfolio performance. Customer experience management is made up of two parts, the product and the process. Let's just have a quick look into what this means. Product can mean a variety of different things. Your product is your building or buildings, but it's also the physical infrastructure you build into, the, build into these buildings, such as sensors, which can have a variety of different uses. It is also your technological product, which can be internal, such as a property management platform that allows you to seamlessly run your portfolio, or it can be customer-facing, such as a residence portal or a customer chatbot. Process, instead, is the way you do things. You can't obviously have a process without a physical product because you need at least one building to actually rent out, but you can have a successful process without any tech at all. Tech is there to make things better, more efficient, more based on real data and less on gut-driven assumptions, but you still need to tell the, t the tech what you want it to achieve, otherwise it's just dead tech. As you own your physical product, you also own your process stra strategy, which is how you choose to brand your product, what are the unique selling points that define your brand, pro brand offering, which customer touch points you consider significant. Basically, the building blocks that make you stand out from the crowd and which you will build your technological offering around. Furthermore, product and process are inextricably intertwined, and in the most successful outcomes, they exist in a continuous feedback loop where errors are constantly corrected, improvements are constantly found and implemented, and the whole proves to be more valuable than the sum of its parts. So this is all good in theory. Um, and as I promised, we were going to talk about concrete examples of what's hot in prop tech. So let's dive in to what developments in prop tech I think you should be excited about in 2020 and beyond. Okay, let's start for, by looking at how prop tech is currently evolving and what we can look forward to. Behind me on the screen, and I hope the font's big enough for you to read, you can see some key trends that we see having some good traction today some change that we see brewing, and transformative future impacts we think all real estate players should understand and get ready for. It's actually pretty straightforward, and I'm going to try and point. Um, so in terms of what we address now and what we're preparing and enabling for, as we become more and more engaged with spaces and with their users, both through sensors and digital applications, we capture data. This data, which is increasingly, increasingly becoming big data, in turn, can feed algorithms which power the AI and ML that allow us to fine-tune a real estate as a service offering down to the segment of one, so down to the single user, the single customer. Off the back of this, owners and operators can confidently build more flexibility into their real estate business models and therefore potentially garner more returns. As for the column down there on the right. Well, let's look at all the various points. Blockchain became a bad word recently, but that technology is evolving, and we can look forward to a future in which it has a meaningful impact for real, for real estate. We can expect ever more precise VR and AR overlays to our reality, whilst robotics and drones will soon become much more than just a cute marketing exercise. I could go on and on about this, but we only have about 20 minutes to run through all the various points. So let's dive in, in no particular order, into the market segments that we, or I, am more ex most excited about for 20 and 20, 2020 and beyond. So first off, valuations. Valuations, let me just put this into perspective for you, is a $25 billion opportunity just in the commercial real estate space. Now, for each of these four steps behind me, I'm going to quickly run you through what tech is currently engendering change to a very manual market and what exciting innovation we expect to see in futures. So first up is pre-valuation and process negotiation. 
Today, contracts can already be entered into digitally. But tomorrow, clients will tender valuations through a portal, being able to select individual properties or entire portfolios that they want to be valued. They, can request, they will be able to request bespoke requirements, contract instantaneously with their service providers, grant access to predetermined data lakes, which we'll talk about later on in this, in this chain, um, pay for all their services, and monitor the progress. Everything can happen automatically. With regards to inspection, uh, well, investigation actually breaks down into inspection and data research, and we'll look at it under both perspectives. So with regards to inspection, today it is possible to gain insight into inaccessible building perspectives through satellite views and drone platforms. And high resolution internal and external images can be analyzed through computer vision. However, tomorrow, AVMs, automatic valuation models, will use computer visions and other sources for an automatic analysis and value calculations. For development purposes, a valuer will be able to use interactive 3D models to determine scenarios rel related to all aspects of the building, building's potential, such as its zoning, restrictions, etc., on any property for any kind of use. With regards to data research instead, today, big data platforms already give anonymized, sorry, anonymized insight into footfall, demographics, consumer behavior, etc. But tomorrow, all historic and current property data, including operating and non-financial data, market data, location-specific data, and sensor data will be stored natively in data lakes that will easily be shared or transferred to other stakeholders across the value chain. Once an AVM is granted access to these data lakes, the data will be instantly accessible, and it will be standard for valuations to use real-time property-specific data. Interpretation. So for interpretation today, AVMs can already provide an instant calculation evaluations using large amounts of data. And these can be conducted from a mobile app workflow. In, futures, in future, however, the AVMs will fo forecast long-term values on specific time horizons, which will become a standard asset management and regulatory inclusion. Finally, reporting. Today, unfortunately, the current reporting evaluations is static and non-interactive. You just get a document spit out from the machine. There is some tech on the market that strives to, ch strives to change this, such as the dynamic dashboards that allow users to view underlying calculations in order to conduct sensitivity analyses on the data. In future, however, AVMs will instantly report valuations on a single client dashboard, on which the client will then be able to conduct sensitivities analysis, sensitivity analyses with instance update by the, um, updates by the AVM, and they'll be able to benchmark against other properties or with other stakeholders. Retail is an enormous market. It is a multi-million, multi-trillion, sorry, dollar market. According to Deloitte, the top 250 global retailers boast a cumulative revenue of $4.4 trillion. On the screen behind me, you can see a few things that today's customers expect of their retail experience. The retail market is changing, and e-commerce is expected to grow at double the pace of store-based retail, store retail through 2025, with online sales doubling to 35% of all retail by 2030. And as we know, physical stores will continue to close. But physical stores won't disappear, and they will continue to have a predominant share of the market, 70% in 2030. So it is vital that these, these stores and their operators adapt to changing customer needs. It's also worth noting that in the retail value chain, you actually have three very interconnected stakeholders. The customer and the retailer, of course, where the latter is competing against e-commerce and struggling with the death of the high street. But you also have the operator who owns the retail assets and needs to innovate to serve its two clients, the retailer and the customer and the end user. So for each of those four customer needs that we looked at uh, two slides back, let's see what opportunities are available to both re retailers and operators through, through the use of tech. Retailers can use analytics to profile customers across channels, and I'm starting with this one here, point one. So retailers can profile customers across channels, while operators can leverage the omni-channel approach by leasing space to digitally native brands and building customer profiles both across different retailers and across different channels. 
we're looking at personalization now. Whilst retailers can personalize their offering through loyalty programs, in-store in customer tracking, and beacon-driven location marketing, operators can once again leverage their cross-retailer reach for even more detailed personalization across their asset pool. I'm talking about frictionless now. Retailers are already investing heavily in offline to online integration, as well as in-store tech, such as smart mirrors, self-checkout, and RFID technologies to manage inventories seamlessly. But operators can enhance this by aggregating logistic services into their offerings to retailers and supplying retailers with the tech they, they need to manage their stores more effectively. Finally, and we are here, and it says experiential. I can tell that the blue is not very easy to read. Immersive tech and in-store product discovery helps retailers give, the, give their users an outstanding experience. There is a reason why, for example, sport, sports retailers will provide fitness classes in-store. Operators can support these kinds of activities by running analytics on activities across their portfolios, as well as driving experiences by integrating co-working and co-living in underused, underused spaces in their portfolios. Many aspects of a warehouse can be made smart. Whether this benefits the occupier, the owner, or both, the value added from the tech you can see in the Venn diagram behind me uh, will fall into one of three categories. The first category is efficiency gains. These increase sustainability and productivity for occupants. For example, a building management system integrated with motion and occupancy sensors can regulate air conditioning and lighting in the space in real time, thereby reducing energy costs. This also allows for better portfolio-wide benchmarking for owners and facilitates efficient operations and digital services as more flexible warehouses are, demanding, are demanded. Sorry. With tech, you can, for example, preempt repair or maintenance issues by enabling building managers to take the appropriate corrective, a a corrective action. Sorry again. The second category of the three is product differentiation. An owner, can, an owner can differentiate his product offerings by identifying unmet consumer demands, such as providing occupants with data insights and developing better designed products. Finally, tech allows warehouse operators to explore additional revenue streams by providing analytics as a service through the combination analysis and presentation of insights gained from specific occupants and aggregated data sets. In fact, through data, owners can provide energy efficiencies, flexible op opportunities for warehouses, and addi additional logistics services. I know I'm speeding through these, and then we can go into more detail on anything you find particularly interesting in the questions. So according to PwC, the use of BIM and digital twins will produce 3% savings across the whole life costs of a project. Now, on the surface, this may not seem as much, until you remember that returns on real estate are mostly in the single digits, and we're talking about life cycles that are decades long. Just to clarify, although I'm sure you guys already know this, um, as you can see on the screen, the BIM model is only for the purpose of the design and construction of the building, whereas digital twins, which is something you've covered a lot today already, um, take the as-built models, layer continuous flow of sensor data over it, and produce value-generating analytics. The benefits of both BIM and Digital Twin are plentiful. There's only a few of them behind me on the screen, which I will try to run through quickly. Designing and building in BIM allow, allows for the reduction of costs and delays, as it permits a more precise execution of a construction project. BIM collaboration allows for error detection before work is carried out in the field, and procurement can be tightly managed through the platform, shortening timelines and reducing stocking issues. Further, a 3D map already exists for future operations. In the operational phase, on the other hand, a digital twin model can help reduce costs through a variety of measures, such as waste and water management, predictive maintenance, intelligence, intelligent HVAC systems, smart lighting, ESG data, and certifications. Revenues can be, bu can be boosted with occupancy and utilization analytics, data-driven space planning, and more. Security can be boosted with access control solutions and artificial intelligence over CCTV. When selling the asset at the, end, at the end of your ownership of it, Digital Twin can help redux, reduce friction and increase returns from the sale of the asset. Um, the reduction of friction is thanks to the implementa implementation of digitized leases and smart contracts, as well as, as well as intelligent data rooms, which improve transparency. 
Finally, last but not least, let's talk about the office market. We all know that buildings and leases are both getting smart. The two main ways they're doing so is through flexible leases and smart buildings, which is the topic of this conference. So first of all, let's look at flexible leases. Flex leases are vastly better aligned with evolving business needs. Occupiers can focus on their business instead of worrying about real estate operations. In fact, they're proving to be so popular that flex operators are currently on track to reduce costs to below comparable fixed leases. There is also a shift in market geography, where the APAC market is now expected to overtake EMEA in the volume of supply of flexible office space during 2021. So, what about smart buildings? We saved the best for last. According to JLL, by creating an interactive, dynamic environment that responds to occupants' needs seamlessly and in real time, smart building technology helps businesses to bridge the gap between the built environment and the occupant experience. The smart building model works off the digital twin model we just looked at a couple of slides ago. Now, let's just bear in mind that global revenue for smart commercial building, so just commercial building, IoT, is expected to increase to $84 billion by 2022, which is a 19.4% growth rate. Smart building models provide both operational and human data each adding value, as we already discussed earlier. Operational data can fall under three macro buckets, which are energy consumption, asset health, and environmental data. On the other hand, human data also has three buckets, occup occupancy analytics, access control, and tenant engagement. Just these six points would merit an entire presentation in of, the, in of uh, their own right, because there is so much to talk about with regards to them. So if you agree, I'm going to stop here with the bird's, bird's eye overview on the greatest opportunities in PropTech. I'm aware that we only scratch the surface, and I would be thrilled to grow, go into any of these, these points in greater detail with you in the questions or, or after, after this. Thank you. And I'm not sure how I did on time. You did so, great. Okay. You did great. Thank you. And thank you for coming to help share that. Thanks for uh, having I'm me. I'm going to open it up to questions regarding uh, prop tech and some of the other areas that she's raised. But, you know, I, I wanted to start off just by asking my own question. And then, After, of course. You know, with your bird's eye view, if you were an investor <laughs> looking at the prop tech, which area do you think would be most exciting for you at the moment? Oh my goodness, these five that I talked about are five yeah. that, I, the, I should say that yeah. um, I asked the guys at Concrete to help me figure out the areas that uh -huh. are interesting from what they're looking at, the tech and okay. the startups they're looking at. So I would say these five are all equally valuable. Yeah. And then the next step is to look at what the startups are doing, because obviously yeah. the devil is in the detail and you have to really see the individual opportunities yeah. that are being brought to you. Um, I've always been a massive fan of everything that is, um, that is related to the service of real yeah. estate. I think that is one of the biggest underlying themes. Um, any tech that adds value on that aspect, yeah. so uh, allowing to extract more value than just the physical asset from the asset, I think, is, is where the market is going. The value added service. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have the uh, camera, the microphone in a box come around, uh, so if you have a question, you know, ra raise your hand in that. I wanted to say that in your articles in Forbes, I see that you're, you're uncovering a lot of new companies yeah. constantly, and, um, and this is one reason I'm following your writing <laughs> forms. Uh, are there a couple new companies that you thought were interesting that might be worth mentioning, some of the ones that you've met recently that are doing something interesting? So, um, w I w rather than ma name specific names, yeah. so I think that mm -hmm. might be unfair sure. on some of the others, maybe we can talk, about, I can tell you a bit more about some of the tech that I've seen yeah, coming sure. to the market. And one thing that I, that's very interesting is that I asked a bunch of VCs at the end of last year to give me their yeah. predictions for what was going to happen in the prop tech yeah. market this year. And one of the themes they shared was end-to-end um, -end integration. So what we've been yeah. seeing a lot of 
up till now is a lot of very good, very siloed solutions. So, yeah. for example, in let's say in, in, in the office space, you would have mm -hmm. the startup that provides the sensors, the startup mm -hmm. that provides the tenant experience app, you would have yeah. something only for the air conditioning, something yeah. only for the lighting, let's right. say. And, and the wish that all the VCs that I speak to regularly expressed to me at the end of last year was to see more end-to-end -end solutions. Yeah. And I started to see a few startups that do provide that. So just yeah. one startup that I've interviewed recently is now trying to provide end-to-end -end solutions in terms of um, residential pr um, portfolio management. Okay. And I mean, it's just one example. It's sure. just the latest one I looked mm -hmm. at. But it's interesting to see that as the market matures, um, companies are starting to not just focus on their immediate niche, but serving the clients across the whole value chain within their asset right. class. And, and that's actually been a recurrent theme, if you've picked up on it, that the this end-to-end -end integration is, is what the market wants in all aspects of it mm -hmm. and that. Questions you know, regarding prop tech and regarding some of the other things that were brought up? I, I think they're getting tired before lunch. <laughs> That's so. fine. I'm also happy to just speak to anybody who wants yeah. anything more, but I think there's a question Okay, there. good. Super. Hi, uh, Antoine from Sharing Cloud. Just a question about um, what you think about the ability of the big players the property owners and builders to adapt the technologies and to transform it into actual services to uh, the tenants or um, on the multi-tenant uh, buildings. I missed the last bit, but let me try and answer to what I heard, and then you can you can tell me if I missed something. So I don't think that the size of a company is an obstacle towards their tech implementation. It's all about your internal strategy. So if you have buy-in at the C-suite level. So if the whole company believes in the need to innovate, then there shouldn't be any barriers towards um, any size company really implementing tech in making their real estate offering better. Um, the most successful outcomes tend to be the ones where the innovation side of things is allowed to operate as an independent entity. So they're giving the, 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 um, the freedom to explore, experiment, make mistakes, invest, acquire, develop things in-house. There's no rule. You don't have to build it all in-house. You don't have to only work with startups. There's many different ways of doing things, but it, it, the innovation department needs to be free to innovate. I think that's the, that, that's the golden rule. Did that answer your question? Yes. I think you. you did a good job with that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks. again.